continuing with the Industrial Revolution. Um, all right, so we left off last time, remember, we're talking about the Luddites, and they're these saboteurs, they destroy the factories, they're going against the, um, uh, in the whole industrial system. Now, the, the government starts, uh, we talked about the working conditions and how harsh they were. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the factory acts. All right, another, the way the government started by about uh, the uh, late 1840s, early 1850s, the government in some ways started going against uh, its own belief in laissez-faire. So uh, if you look at the earlier period, uh, you know, right before then, they basically, uh, people competing for jobs, whoever made it, got one, whoever didn't, ended up in a workhouse. Uh, but, uh, you know, pretty, pretty harsh uh, living conditions. Well, with the Factory Acts, the government starts uh, regulating the, uh, the factory system to some extent. Uh, and the first thing that they do with part of the Factory Acts is they say uh, no children under uh, age um, 10 can work uh, in the... Um, uh, mines and no children under age nine can work in the factories. Now, who do you think is going to be against that idea? Who is this benefiting? The parents. Okay, so the parents might be against it. The factory owners. Definitely the factory owners, yes. See, the factory owners. Um, here's the argument they're going to make. They're going to say there's no way we're able, going to be able to compete and keep prices low if we can't have children working in the factories. Remember, they preferred hiring women and children because they're more agile, you could pay them less, and um, you could um, scare them into working harder more than you could adult uh, men. So they said, if we don't allow this, how, how are we supposed to run a business? It's going to be the same argument that everyone makes as soon as they talk about raising the minimum wage. They're going to say, you're going to throw us out of business. Uh, now, notice, in the mines, they're now not going to be allowed to have children working there. In the factories, they're not going to be able to have really young children working there. But where's one place that children can still be exploited? Farms. Right, very good, farms. And who uh, controls the farms? Uh, no. I, I mean, for the independent, like family farms, yes, but what, what about these really big commercial ones? Right, good. The rich cash crop owners, so the aristocrats. Remember that whole thing, they raised the taxes so that they could get control of their farms. Uh, so who were the ones who were in charge of the government? Same group, the aristocrats. So they're not passing, they're saying it's exploitative to make the children work in the factories and in the mines, but you can still have seven-year-olds working on the farms all day. People don't pass laws that are going to hurt themselves and people like them. So that kind of exploitation continues. But here's what's interesting. The, uh, unlike the child labor laws in the U.S. about um, 30 years later, the ones in Britain, the factory acts, they actually enforce. See, a law doesn't mean anything if the government doesn't really enforce it. So whether it's uh, no underage drinking, no jaywalking, no weed smoking, if the people aren't going to follow it and the government's not going to enforce it, or nowadays no shoplifting, does it really mean anything? It only means something if the government's actually going to enforce it. Was 
Yeah, the Triangle Shirt Waist Company. That yeah. that's um, that, that's that's America, nineteen oh six. After that, that's when they start beginning to enforce it. You're right. That's a pivotal event because that was so horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's good. Uh, so anyway, so that's the Factory Act. So passing uh, laws uh, regulating children working in fact in factories and in mines, but not on farms. And they're going to be about uh, 19, uh, sorry, 18, 1849 to 1851, depending on which, which of the acts. Now, we were talking before um, uh, about laissez-faire capitalism, or as it's called, economic liberalism. We talked a little bit about that at the beginning of the, um, uh, the course. And um, all right, so I, uh, let me put that back up there. So uh, part, part of that whole idea coming from Adam Smith, this idea of the wealth of nations, and remember he said that the way nations become, can become the richest possible is by lack of government involvement in the economy. Let people follow their own self-interest that they know what's best for them economically and they're going to do what's best for them. Because, you know, when we think of um, uh, capitalism, Capitalism is based on the idea of competition. One business competing with another. Businesses that are, uh, let's say, ones that don't change with the times, that do things the old way. What's gonna happen to them? They're, they're going to basically be thrown out of business because you have other ones who are more efficient. So, or, or let's say, like a restaurant. Okay, let's say, a popular type of restaurant for businessmen during the 1950s, as you know, if anyone's seen the uh, TV series Mad Men. So it, it kind of shows a lot of them uh, drinking uh, three martini lunch at a, uh, a steak uh, restaurant with you know a, a 16 ounce uh, sirloin and. Uh, well, how, how, how often do, is business conducted that way today? Not very much. You know, now, nowadays, uh, something very light, and they'll give you spring water. So let's go back to the other way. But no, no, but, uh, uh, but no, they, they, they um, but, so how, how well is a company going to um, be that doesn't change with the time that still does business that way, where, you know, they have the three martini lunch, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, 12 ounces of gin, hip bottle, and, um, you know, a, a pound of uh, beef. They're not going to make it today because that's not the way that people eat today. I would say unfortunately, but I'll let you decide that for yourself. Uh, but, um, so if they don't adapt with the times, uh, they're just going to be thrown out of business. So there's this competition. Uh, and... Um, part of that competition is uh, the business has to decide for itself what's in its best interest. If they can sell things doing um, the other way and there's enough people that still want to have a business launches that way, then they can make it. If they decide, wait a minute, nobody's eating that way anymore, then they have to adapt. If they don't adapt, they die off. All right, so there's this idea of uh, competition, and um, but then there's there's also the idea of the capitalist versus the proletariat. Remember we talked about that idea the first day, this idea of class conflict. Well, Marx gets in an uproar, you know, an uproar because he sees the few people that own the factories are making most of the money, whereas the ones working it are doing almost all the work and they're not getting very much at all. So he sees that as unfair. Uh, Adam Smith is arguing that no, uh, it's in people's own, 
people know what's best for them. If they can do better, they're going to work somewhere else. If they can't do any better, they're uh, stuck where they are. That's not the government's problem or responsibility. It's your own. Get the skills, compete, uh, find a better job, get the skills you need for a better job. It's not the government's problem whatsoever. All right, so uh, what you begin to see is um, uh, this, this lazy fair capitalism that we see with the factories. The, the factory owner is the capitalist. The factory worker is the proletariat. It's that whole class conflict that we talked about. Now, um, that whole capitalism is really what's called lazy fair capitalism which means capitalism without government involvement, which is what you have at the time in the English factory systems. Now, another word for laissez-faire capitalism is they also call it economic liberalism. So someone that believes in this would be called a liberal. Is that what a liberal means today? No, it flip-flops. It means the exact opposite today. Today, that view would be much more of a conservative. Liberals are always talking, wait a minute, the government needs to protect the people, the government needs to decide things, which best for the majority of people in society. The Republicans talking more, you're on your own, it's your responsibility, uh, you need to compete. So it's interesting how the two uh, flip-flops in the 20th century. All right, well, part of that uh, is based on this idea of uh, number two here, what's called the invisible hand. The invisible hand means something is, um, the value of something is determined by the marketplace, whether it's your wages or whether it's the price of goods. So if you price something too high, what happens? It won't sell. If you price something too low, then someone's getting a better deal off of you than you really had to give them. Where the two agree is what you're willing to pay for it and what somebody else is willing to sell uh, the price uh, thing for. So let's say you want to sell your sweater at $100 because that's what you think it's worth. So that's what you price it on eBay. But nobody's um, going to pay that much for it. They're only going to pay $55 for it. Uh, that's going to be what the, the real price is because that's all anyone will pay for it. You can give it whatever number you want, but if no one will pay that much for it, it's not worth that. It's only worth what somebody will pay for it. Now, another part where we see the invisible hand is in the relationship between the, the employer and the employee. Are, now, is the employer and the employee, are they after the same thing? Or is this an adversarial relationship? All right, so let's say you're working at McDonald's. Uh, and um, does um, the employer want the same thing out of you as you want? Or are they oppositional, adversarial? Yes, why? I mean, how do you see that? Well, because um, the employee just wants their own wages and they want to get paid, and the employer wants, cares more about like, the performance and quality of work. Okay, yeah. So let, let's just take it in turn. So, okay, ideally, how much would your employer like to pay you? As little as possible. As little as possible. So they don't even want to pay you minimum wage. They want to get it, you know, now what's minimum wage in Pennsylvania? I don't know. 7.50 an hour or something. So they don't even want to pay you the 7.50 an hour. They like to pay you $1.50 an hour and just call it student wages. And they want you working all the time. They want you to be the fry guy, the one that opens the store, the expediter, the one that closes uh, the store. And um, they uh, just want you working all the time and then also paying for your food. What about you? You want the exact opposite. You want to do next to nothing, do the least work possible. You want to just sit on a big high chair all day and say, welcome to the store. So be like a 
Walmart reader, but in McDonald's. You want to have your friends come in all the day long for free food, and uh, you want to be paid $100 an hour to do nothing. So they want to pay you nothing. You want to be paid a fortune to do nothing. Where does it end up? Somewhere in the middle, where you both agree. You'll work for that price, and they expect this amount of work out of you. And then you're still trying to get around it, and they're still trying to get more work out of you. So that's the invisible hand, it's just deciding what the real value of your labor is. So does anyone have any question about how that works? Okay, we'll let it go with that. The, the next thing, Robert Owen's gonna be, it's a long thing, so. It, Good weekend, see you on.